Today, today we're talking from the title authority, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Cause when we hear the word authority, that's exactly what we think, right? It's like my son, my son is known for this whole concept of just saying blah, 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 blah. Like he does that with me all the time. We have these back and forth conversations, conversations. And when he doesn't want to hear a certain thing, jokingly, he'll say blah, 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 blah. Sometimes he got out of hand. And so I kind of raise him a voice a little bit because I'm from the old school. I can't tell you any more than that because I don't want y'all reporting. And so, um, you know, and, and so there's a level of all of us having this idea that we really don't want to hear about anything to deal with authority. We run from authority conversations. We don't want anyone to suffocate our ingenuity, our creativity, our swag, our momentum. We don't want no rules. We just want to make the rules as we go. So today we're dealing with authority because I want to deal with it from a perspective of talking about it, but also I believe it's one of the reasons why many people don't have their manifestation. In other words, what people are praying for, they're not getting because God refuses to co-sign rebellion. Now, I know you already like, oh, my God, preacher. No, God is more gracious than that. He's going to make an exception for me. No, God is very clear that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. It doesn't matter who does it. It doesn't matter if you're the king he has allowed to be appointed. He doesn't matter if you are whoever you are in title or form, shape, or function. God says he will never co-sign rebellion. No matter who you are. I don't care. You could be the most loving Christian, generous Christian in the world. If you are walking in chaos and confusion and disorder and out of orderliness, God says, I can't bless you. Now, some of y'all I've lost already, and that's, what's, that's the missing link between you and your next level right there. And I want to unlock this key for you because I want you to actually see what you're praying for. How many want to see what they've been praying for? I want to see it. I just don't want to keep praying for it. I want to see it. So I'm going to ruffle your feathers. I'm going to make you feel uncomfortable today. I'm going to ask you and challenge you to do something today that goes against your nature, and that is to learn how to embrace authority. I know that's hard for us. It's hard for us because we're like, hold on, dude. I don't listen to just any kind of authority. And so we're very critical of authority figures because we have either been abused by authority or authority has hurt us. And we're like, never again. But the truth of the matter is all of us have to comply with levels of authority. And today I want to help you unlock the key because we run away from authority. We don't like the subject matter. But I'm here to tell you all that you cannot minister in God's authority without submitting to God's authority. See, you cannot. See, Jesus was the epitome of who we're supposed to be. He is our example, right? Jesus did nothing against the Father. In fact, scriptures are very clear. I don't have it in your outlines, but I want you to write these key references down. In John 5 and 30, Jesus makes it clear in John 5 and 30. He says, I do nothing without consulting the Father. I do just as I am told. Look at that. You can't be a Christian and talk about you got your own revelation. You got your own order. You got your own swag. You got your own thing. And then you can't say that I'm being used to God when God is giving you authority in your life. I mess half y'all up. You're like fighting me right now. I see you in the spirit. I'm coming for your house today. I ain't scared of you. I promise you I'm not. Because the last thing I want you to do is to miss God and wait another 10 years. I'm trying to help you out. So this is going rough. I'm going to be the bad parent today. I'm going to tell you you're on punishment. But I'm saving you from the disaster outside. In John 8 and 26, you can write that down as another reference. Jesus says, I have much to say about you and much to condemn, but I want. For I say only what I have heard from the one who sent me. Jesus said, I can say a lot to y'all, but I'm only going to say what God the Father has told me to say. What? He didn't say, but God, I am a prophet. But God, I healed the sick and raised the dead. Jesus knew that the only way his power flowed was through submission of authority. Jesus couldn't do anything apart from the Father. And he tells us, without me, you can do nothing either. I didn't mess half y'all up right there again. I didn't mess half y'all ministry starting on www.memindeyeministry.com because I'm trying to help you. I don't want you to miss this glory movement. I don't want you to be in the wilderness of God finding yourself wondering if you made the terrible mistake of trying to go without the glory. 
I'm, I got to prepare the house because, see, God is doing some weird kind of stuff in the house. And we don't know necessarily how to manage it because some of us have not been this way before. But God raised up this little nappy head boy in the year 1977 named David Hawkins where I was able to see the glory of the 80s church, the glory of the 90s church, and the desert of the 2000 church. So I'm able to translate how we can get out of control with the glory. Because I've seen a lot of folk jump off the proverbial ledge because they felt a moment of inspiration, got used of God to lay hands on two people, one which they pushed down, the other one which would fell down. And then all of a sudden they have layhandsonus.com ministries. And those ministries don't exist. They lasted a good 16 months, maybe two years, and they petered out. But they pulled people and they pulled away from things God was blessing. And money was wasted. Resources and talent was wasted. So they can simply get their little adrenaline rush. Because it's important for you to understand the glory will intoxicate you into believing you are stronger than you are. I'll give y'all an example of this. Some of y'all know that I, I, uh, in an amateur level, but professional level of the amateur level, race race bicycles. Like really, like these, these really lightweight bicycles. And we like go from, you know, just on last Monday, Memorial Day, I was like going on this one road and we were right at about 55 miles an hour. Like it was downhill on this one. But we were like moving and we were having just a good battle between several of us. And we putting out a lot of energy 52 miles later. And so it's a very important, I think, dynamic that's biblically relevant. It's this thing called the Peloton, which you all see all the cyclists together in this big group inches apart that's called the Peloton, the group of cyclists together. It's some powerful physics that's involved in this Peloton. When you are at the front of the Peloton, you are the only guy up front. You are the one little bird in front of it. You are exerting more energy. You are putting out a lot of energy. But if you are that guy or gal that's right in the middle, you are actually putting out 30% less effort And in your mind, when you're in the peloton, you're saying, why aren't they going faster? Not realizing the only reason you have as much energy is because the one all the way in the front is creating a vector for you. They're breaking the resistance and the wind for you. Aerodynamics. And so you can oftentimes miss your calling because you are getting the benefits of the peloton, not realizing the only reason you're able to flow. Yeah, no, hold on, y'all. Catch this. The only reason you're able to flow is because your leader has broken the resistance up front. See, y'all need to understand that. So you all energetic, you all like, we can do that. Why the pastor ain't ready to go a hundred more miles? (laughs) I can do it. Put me in. You want to win? Put booby in. (laughs) Y'all will catch that. We miss it because we forgot the power of group dynamics. And you create almost a vector where the wind doesn't impact you if you're in the center or the middle as much as it does those in the front. Even those all the way in the back benefit from the vector of those in the front. If we get this in the church and quit trying to be superstars, bigger than myself. And realize we are better together, do more together, which means we need to start mitigating, eliminating, and calling out anything that tries to break up the peloton. Some of us miss this because we have never seen the blessing of the oil from the head to the feet. And you miss that God is a God of order. He's a God of order and God has incrementally and he has parceled out order and authority in various components of our lives. Jesus made it clear that I do a lot, but only thing I do is what the Lord, what the father rather has told me I should do. 
Now, here's the deal. We all have a level of authority we need to submit to. For example, if you have a boss, how many got a boss? How many got a job? Okay, okay. Whoa, whoa, whoa. God, you raise our hand back up. Let me count some, let me count some blessings. Look at the oh, y'all got a job. Can I get five dollars from you today? Truth be told, it's on your job. There are policies and procedures, right? There, there is someone you have to that's a cuss word. You have to Ooh, I can't God the Holy Ghost don't let me let this out God Ooh, that's a nasty word okay let me submit to that you have to submit to and no matter how you think you know it all the moment you walk into the meeting and try to exercise authority over your boss pack all your stuff up I'll never understand why people fight those who feed them Y'all missed that right there. Why? I, I made a vow. I will not fight nobody I'm feeding. Let my son come up against me. I'm going to look at him like, whoa, what? You don't want this food? Go to sleep. Soon as you wake up at midnight talking about, Daddy, I got belly grumblings. Swallow your spit. Chew your fingernails. God be with you. Vitamin C, D, and E there, and dirt. See, see, we, I, I, why, we have this messed up mindset. It can be intracultural, it can be cross cultural, that we tend to fight who feeds us and partner with who can't give us a dollar for bubble gum. You would rather have a like. Than to have a destiny. See, you would rather have, okay, a social media like than have a destiny. God is trying to get you to benefit from covering. Okay, okay, all right, all right. What? At church, there's authority. God put people in authority in church. There's order to church. There is a level of flow to church and we'll come to our jobs and we will submit to our jobs. But then we'll come to church with this independence MacGyver mindset that we go reinvent the wheel. And then we got the nerve to say stuff like at my last church, baby, there it go. <laughs> right. And we get mad at what's working. Instead of to contribute to it, we'd rather critique it dis and downsize it. All right, y'all, I'm, I'm I'm I know I'm in the house. And then there is society. We have civil authorities. As much as you may not like number 45, I guarantee you, you better not go up and punch him. You're going to have about 20 guys in black suits thump you. You're going to get all kinds of pumpkin heads. You, 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 you better not run up on you go have you go you go hear something from a building and go Poof. wait wait about two seconds <laughs> there is authority and respect see I don't care how if, a, if, 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 if in all this day and we have our we have our bad situations and then we have our situations that are considerably good but there's our bad situations too but if a sheriff comes to my house which he would have no reason to come but if he came to my house to serve a warrant for my arrest and let's say he was five feet tall I'm six foot four let's say I came out the door looked down and I was taller than him and he had his suit he had all of his stuff in, in order and I felt I could take him and in that moment I ran back with all of the ghettoosity in my right hand and I pow slap him and say get away from my door then I take his gun from his holster and disarm him and throw him away from my property and said this is my property I might get away with that one incident but I better not be surprised that the whole block is cornered off and that armored truck comes outside <laughs> what I'm gonna say then what they gonna do when they come for you you know Nobody now getting your pain. <laughs> right? See, we got to respect authority in the civil arena. Go in front of a judge on Monday. Go to court on Monday and tell judge, give that judge a piece of your mind. I mean, let that judge have it. Don't be surprised. 
you have to call all your family and see if they can cash up you some loan money to get out of jail. We're going to have you on Facebook. Go fund me. No, we ain't funding your rebellion. What you say? Told him a piece of my mind. Well, it cost the talk. <laughs> Amen, somebody. It cost the talk. It, it, it cost, I don't know about y'all, but when I was growing up, it cost me to talk. It cost me to express my opinion. When I told my mama and my daddy a good piece of my mind in the car while they were driving, I would feel the blessedness of their fingers. And y'all ever shake my mama's hand? Y'all ought to know something about that. Oh, God, have mercy. If she ever shook your hand, she'll hit you on the back and you will have all the phlegm come up. That was from practice of 12 knucklehead boys and one girl. She, she understood and we understood boundaries that there was their car and they were driving it the way they wanted to in the direction they determined. I told my son the other day, he said, Daddy, we ain't there yet. Where are we going? Daddy, we ain't there. I said, boy, can you drive? He said, no, Daddy. I said, you better shut up. I'm going to leave you out here. Right. See, we have to understand authority. See, authority comes from God, and it is not based upon our respect for the person, but our respect for the office. Even when we talk about number 45, you may not respect him, which I have a whole lot of reasons not to. I think he's a goofball. I think of all the things we could have elected, we literally could have elected anything else. But he's there now. I ain't got to comply with nothing, but I got to respect the office. Y'all get my drift? I, I think he's a buffoon. I'm going to say it. Yes. I think like, oh my God, is this train wreck continuing? But I got to respect the office. My buddy is an officer and I have back and forth conversations with him about the whole way law enforcement is practicing law enforcement in inner city community. We go back and forth and there are times our conversations get real heated. But I will never ever put myself in a position to disrespect and dishonor what he stands for. And not maybe, that, maybe that's the takeaway today. Maybe we should be able to have good, healthy conversation without creating contention. Y'all get that? Ooh, I know I'm in the house. Y'all like, oh my God, you're edgy today. Why you're so edgy, preacher? I ain't, I ain't even done yet. Hell, 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 buckle up. Authority comes from God, and when we honor it, we get blessed by God. See, God doesn't bless independent rebels who love to cover their motives with scriptures and pity parties. It's a lot of times we say stuff like, God, I'm going to do this in Jesus. Name. God, I'm going I'm to I'm gossip on them in Jesus' name. Lord, I'm going to tear this church up in Jesus' name. The Lord sent me to correct y'all in Jesus' I wish the devil would. See, we have this idea that we can be an independent agent, free agent of God, and we think God's going to co-sign us being out of order. Ooh I, I know y'all like, whoa, this is deep, preacher. This is deep. Oh, this is cutting good. The word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. It cuts deeply because we got to get the cancer out so that we can save the body. And most of us are missing our next level because God can't trust us to be compliant with the blessed requirements of the next level. That's all I'm trying to get you to understand. I want you blessed because I believe that when one rise, we all rise. When I eat, you eat. That's my philosophy. When I get blessed, you get blessed. So I want you to overflow in blessings. I want everything you touch to be golden. But God, let me tell y'all something. I have yet to see someone go another way and get to heaven. Jesus says they come as a thief and a robber if they don't come through me. See, I, I, you got to capture this idea. And I want to get to the first part of the handout. We have confessions to make about authority. The first one is we don't like authority. How many can say amen? That's me too. I can raise my hand. I hate anybody got a micromanaging boss. Okay, let me not say they might be here. Um, truth of the matter is I can't stand micromanaging I just like let me live let me be let me let me be famous for a day let me let me be great you know I like to have like I'm, I'm a distracted person I do five things to accomplish one thing 
I'm a Gen Xer. I'm, I'm confused. I, I, I have a little bit of millennial uh, characteristics with Gen X characteristics, and I have nothing to, I have no knowledge of the baby boomer generation. And so I tend to be multitasker, a multitasker that loves a lot of confusion going on in order to get one task. So when even I'm doing sermons, I have the TV on, I have the radio on playing orchestra music, and then I'll be sitting there wondering, why, what are you saying? And that's my environment. With an eight-year-old running around, jumping and playing Transformers in the background. And that's my vibe. That's how I thrive. Like, y'all like, what? Yes. I got to have stuff going on. I can't stand authority, though. When you come in my place and tell me, you shouldn't do this, I look at you and like, you, you, it's on. I'm going to fight you. Today, you're going down. It's not going to be cute. We all have an issue to some degree with authority, and which leads you to the second confession. We fight against it. We fight against it. Teenagers fight against their parents all the time. They fight against their parents all the time. They're trying to show their parent, you don't know nothing. I remember the days. I don't know why I ever prayed that I would be grown. What in the world? I wish there were some prayers that never came true. I used to be like, I can't wait till I get... Do I got any witnesses here? You prayed that and you said that to your parents in rebuke, in, in, in rebuttal to what they, they said, did, or whatever they said you couldn't do. You're like, I can't wait to have them. Listen, listen, I, the adult life ain't for everybody. <laughs> that needs to be like a B track or something, like B adults, right? You know, wow. amen. Wow. Right? I, them bills, man, they come every month. Yeah. Wow. Hallelujah to God. My God, they come every month. And, they, and then the, the, the pay periods are getting shorter and shorter. Used to give you a whole month. Now it's like literally 11 days. You're like, doggone it, I just got it. <laughs> Less grace now. You call in. Can you remove this uh, 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 late charge? You only get one per year. We used to get one every month. Now it's one per year. So now you got to barter and pray. Like, All right, this time. May the Lord be with you. May the grace of God be upon us all. Adult ain't for everybody. And now we're adults. We're like, "Mm mm-mm. But we fought our parents, didn't we? I don't know about y'all. I can't go to the party. I can't. You telling me I can't go to the party? I can't go get lit. I can't go turn down for what? I can't go and say all I do is win, win, win with my hands up. Leave it there. Leave it there. Leave it there. What? Now I'm grown, I want to take a nap. <laughs> want to be home. <laughs> Leave me alone. Give me a bag of popcorn and some water with electrolytes in it. Some, some muscle rubs will go over the aching bones. Praise the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 We live also in hypocrisy concerning authority. As much as we hate it, we want it. When we're in authority, we want people to comply with us. But when we're under authority, we want to buck against authority. That's the hypocrisy of authority. It's like when I'm, in, when I'm over the program, I want everybody to do what I say do because in God's house we walk in excellence. We couldn't get you to church on time. When you was following in the, in the, in the particular ministry, you, you was, ah, why we got to do all that? What's all that necessary for? Why I got to say that? Why, 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 why? But, but as soon as you get an authority, we shall be. <laughs> right? This is the house of God. As soon as you get power, you want to be on time. Been late 25 years straight. As soon as you're over the program, y'all give. Let's look at your giving report. You giving? <laughs> but when we're in authority, all of a sudden, this thing comes over us, which lets this confession be true. We live in hypocrisy to it. When under it, we hate it. When over it, we love it. Which leads us to the last part. Authority is good for us. It protects us. 
It helps us. And that's what we're going to get into a little bit. I want to share a couple of thoughts with you in the Bible. In the Old Testament, the Bible lists three angels. It lists us and gives us names of three angels. Now, there's many other angels, but gives us names of three for a reason. It gives us Michael, who is the angel of war. It gives us Gabriel, who is the messenger angel. Then it gives us Lucifer. Lucifer, the angel of light, the angel that had all of this beauty in heaven. And here's what happened. Y'all know Lucifer decided one day to elevate himself and overthrow God. And literally, Jesus says he saw Satan or Lucifer fall from heaven like lightning can i give y'all his preamble his speech can i give y'all his acceptance speech to being dethroned can i give y'all what it sounds like to be on the brink of something great that ends in disaster i'll share with you in isaiah 14 verse number 13 through 14 here's what it says here's lucifer's speech god gives the prophet some insight to what he said he says i will ascend to heaven this is lucifer talking he's known as son of the morning i will ascend to heaven I will raise my throne above the stars of God, stars of God or other angels. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will send above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. I want, to ca- I want you to capture a trend here, a repetitive trend here. Notice how he uses these two words, I will. Anytime someone is about to hit the wall of failure, you will oftentimes hear them repeat what I They use the word I a whole lot. And the difference between the Christian who is submitted and the Christian who's in rebellion can be actually identified by two words, pride and humility. By its literal spelling, you can tell who is literally being used of God and who is not. Humility is H-U. So when I'm walking in humility, it's all about you. But when I'm walking pride, P-R-I, it's all about I, me, myself, and I. Pride, the Bible says, comes before fall. He says, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the, amount of a, uh, the, on the mount of a similar. In other words, I'm going to sit on God's throne. And then he says, on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain, I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make who? Myself. Be worshipped. Do y'all know the most abused drug is not heroin? It's, it's not marijuana. The most abused drug today is attention. So many people just want it. He's like, I need some attention. Give me some ATTN. I need some ATTN. Get that vein nice and ready for that ATTN. Because I need it. I need it. I got to just, I need it. I need that ATTN. I need that attention. So I'll do whatever to get some more attention. And you start getting your body conditioned. Those endorphins get conditioned to that attention. And you start letting your life be dictated by that attention. And you start being driven by that attention. And people saying yes and yes and yes and yes and yes. And God says, no. Do not let people put you up where God has not sent you to be. When Moses went to the mount, been with God 40 days, he comes down the mountain and these people are worshiping golden calf because they went to Aaron and says, we don't need him. We're going to make you our leader. Be careful of people that are trying to make you something that God didn't make you because God will wipe out some blessings. Notice the text here says that he made himself like the most high. He wasn't the only one. Adam and Eve, God, you know, we want that tree. We want, we want that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Discontent, not happy. Children of Israel constantly bucked up against God. They were not happy. They got delivered out of Egypt, walked across the Red Sea, had some vans on and some Jordans on that never wore out, had some Gucci and some Louis Vuitton on their body that never got musty. I mean, they had a pillar of cloud to keep them from being tanned more than they were um, uh, per day. They had a night light, a night glow at night, a pillar of fire by night to keep all of the uh, wilderness beasts away from them. They were blessed, but then they got tired. God was said, God gave them panel bread in the middle of the day every day all they had to do was show up with baskets and buckets and they could take home food for everybody I mean God gave them enough for every family nobody had excess they were highly blessed of God so one day they go to Moses and say Moses we a little bit tired you know but yeah God did God did bless us yes he did deliver us out of the most powerful nation in the world at the time yes we did walk across the Red Sea on dry ground yes our shoes have not gone weary or worn our outfits remain intact and God blesses us with a daily provision of food per day, but we're a little tired. We won't, we won't quail. 
went to Moses. And the Bible says Moses was slow of speech, he had a stuttering problem. I know y'all like, well, no, no, you shouldn't make fun of people that stutter. No, no. Moses actually confesses that he had a stutter. He says, I am of a slow tongue. See, the, see the, the, the people went from wanting nice bread that was seasoned from heaven to want some chicken. I got some assumptions of who they were, but that's another story for another day. The Bible has, the Bible, <laughs> the Bible is interesting. The Bible lists the, the chicken. <laughs> These Hebrews wanted some chicken, man. They was like, we tired of this bread. The Bible, the chickens in the Bible get a bad rap. They, first of all, God gives it to them. He says, here, get the quail, take it, eat it, you know, get you some bird. But you know, <laughs> I think, I think ever, since, ever since that chicken told on Peter, we've been crucifying them chickens ever since. <laughs> Y'all know, Jesus told Peter, when the chick crows, you will have denied me three times. He's, why you got to use a chicken? And that's why chick fil A so blessed. <laughs> They've been anointed by God to crucify the chicken. They crucify so well with perfect seasoning and hot sauce, don't they? I mean, they, they serve us breakfast chicken, lunch chicken, dinner chicken. And you go every day looking for a different entree. <laughs> it's called chick fil A. So, it's this, it's this, it's this, it's this. They get, they get discontent with God. God gives it to them. Moses goes before God because now they come to him and say, Moses, we're going to kill you if you don't give it to us. You can imagine the pressure Moses was under. He's like, God, they, they be ready to kill me. And God says, I'm going to rain down quail. They were discontent with God. They kept bucking authority. And many of them missed the promised land because they didn't submit to authority. Another, 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 another was Jonah. Jonah. Jonah heard God tell him, go to Nineveh, cry against the city. Jonah was like, I ain't doing none of that. Ain't happening, Captain. Nope, nope, because I know you're going to grant them repentance. We ain't doing none of that, God. It's been cool, it's been real, but I'm out of here. Goes the opposite direction because he knew that God was going to grant them forgiveness because he knew God's character. But what he was mad at was that the Assyrians had killed his parents. And he was like, hold on, God, you ain't my personal hit man. You know how some of y'all pray? Get him, God. <laughs> I'm going to move on. But who comes to the surface of scripture to me is Saul in the Old Testament. Y'all know Saul when the nation of Israel wanted a king and they was like, God, we're kind of tired of you being our king. So they got a king. And so the Bible says that Saul was appointed as king. And the Bible makes it very clear that he was, I haven't read this as I was studying for this sermon. I was reading this and it just kind of stood out this time more than it did other times. It says he was the most handsome Israelite in all of Israel. I always thought King David was. But it says Saul was like, he was handsome. And it says he stood head and shoulders above everybody. He looked like a king. That's why when Samuel the prophet went to go anoint David, he said to his older brothers, he said in himself, all these look like a king. God says, man looked on the outward appearance, but God sees the heart. Sometimes anyway, oh, I can tell y'all something right now. What it look like ain't what it is. Brother, she fine. Ah, you better watch, watch yourself. God said that Saul might look like a king, but his heart ain't after me. The, the, one, of the, uh, one of the old school preachers actually put this powerfully. What made Saul and David different was that Saul was chasing goats and David was shepherding sheep. If you look at the story of Saul and David, you will find that date one of Saul's indicators of his calling was he was chasing goats. The Bible uses goats as like a bad animal to be characterized as being because they're stubborn. Sheep are humble and, 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 and receptive to the shepherd. And so we find that Saul goes through his career constantly disobeying the boundaries of God. And we'll talk more about that. And that's where we get the scripture where for rebellion, that's the sin of witchcraft. Let me give you the premise of this sermon. We need to get under those things that God has put over us so that we can get over those things God has put under us. Amen, somebody. 
I help you out, y'all. Talk, y'all ain't talking to me that well today. I guess we in the house, y'all. I'ma heal you. I'ma heal you. I'ma put some bandages around you. But we need to get under those things that God has put over us so that we can get over those things God has put under us. God is saying that your blessing is tied to your submission to the authorities that he has put in your life. Amen. You want to get promoted? Submit to authority. Amen. 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 See, when you get under, you receive blessings. And one of those blessings you get is power. The Bible makes it very clear that all authority is given by God. I'm going to just sum up Romans 13. The issue is this. When God authors something, he does not want you to unauthor it. See, look what it says, Romans 13, verse 15, at the very first, verse 1b. There is no authority except that which God has established. Even the crazy powers, God has set those offices in place to a degree. He's limited their power, but God has put, and this is the ideal image we're talking about authority. This is not unrighteous authority. This is not just submit to somebody that's hurting you, hitting you, beating you, and talking bad about you, and denigrating you. That's not that. That's not blanket authority. You should never be in an abusive of atmosphere of in, if God don't beat me you shouldn't either amen. if God don't talk bad about me who gives you the right to talk bad about me amen somebody amen God never gives another human being the right to hurt another human being so that being said for all of y'all who say well we still together baby don't you get mad at me because of what I went through and you talking about the number of years y'all been together and you got more hickeys and scars on your face and head uh-uh, you, you ain't telling me that's God I see I didn't cut again. Y'all like, oh man, I thought we were just turning the corner and you was going to be my friend. I got friends already. According to Facebook, I got 5,000. <laughs> got a whole lot of them. Some of them I never knew, but we friends. Friends? How many of us? Anyway, um... I want to talk to you real powerfully about what it means for us to come under authority. The first thing is this. It provides ultimate protection. I want to give you an idea of things about what it means to be under ultimate protection. Anybody been in a rainy, weathery, rainy situation? Now, you tell me, which umbrella do you want? No takers? More coverage and what else? Protection. Protection. So let's let's see. Let's see. Let's see. It's okay. This will get something done. But if I'm really in a bad storm, I'm gonna get wet. Your hair gonna get wet, and we can't have that happen. Can't have your shoes getting wet. Can't have your shoes getting wet, right, Sister Katrine? Hallelujah. She said that first service. She said, I can't get my shoes wet, Pastor. If you pay less, you get more. That's another story for another day. (laughs) (laughs) Limited protection. See, when the storms of life, when things get tough, you need something that's going to provide maximum protection. See, when you are in God, he gives you maximum protection. Look what Psalms 91 verse 1 and 2 says. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him will I trust. I'm going to move around. Here's what I need y'all to get. When you are abiding in God, you refuse to move left or right. No matter what catches your eye you stay under the covering of God no matter how it's uncomfortable you stay under the covering of God no matter how difficult your season is you stay under the covering of God everybody could be relocating but God didn't tell you you stay under the covering of God everybody talking about living my best life hashtag my best life right now and you like God but I'm suffering and lonely everybody getting married but I'm by my God God said, stay under the covering of God. Everybody seems like they got happy, but I'm sad. God says, stay under the covering of God. Because when you move from under the covering, you get exposed. Might look weird to you. 
but this is blocking cancer. Might look weird to you, but this is keeping the elements off of me. I got, I got somewhere I got to go, and I cannot afford to come from underneath my cover. I ain't got to like everything, but I'm going to submit to it. He that dwells in the secret place that is both exclusive and open. See, God don't force you under the secret place and under the shadow. He says it's there. So all of y'all who keep trying to take God to where you want God to be, he says, I ain't going over there. No, no, no. Y'all trying to take me places that I have not provided coverage for. But the moment you get underneath God, get to where God is, be in relationship, communion and union with God. And God says, I will bless you in him. He will you will have trust because he is your refuge. Can I go a step further? He says in the very next verse, a very present help. I'm sorry, but let me shout right here. A very present help in the time of trouble. What does that look like? When God is very present, it means he is there in extra measure. God will show out for you when trouble comes around you. Why? Because you're under the covering of God and God is saying, I ain't letting nothing hit you, nothing talk about you. Though the weapon is formed, it shall not prosper. Do I got anybody who's been under the covering and when the wicked even your enemies and your foes came to eat up your flesh. They s- Though they came at you one way, they fled before you seven different ways. Do I got anybody that can say I've seen it for myself? I didn't have to reply. I didn't have to hate. I didn't have to lie. I got here because God. You call me weird all you want to. I guarantee you when it's hot outside, you want this. I guarantee you, call me weird, looking all you want to. You that Christian that go to church, God has proven himself to me. This ain't what I think. Tell your neighbor, this is what I know. Because if it had not, let me go back to the old school. If it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, had I been away from the cover, I'd have lost my mind. Had I been away from the covenant, I'd have thrown in the towel. Had I been away from the covenant, I'd have lost a long time ago. But because I'm under the covering of God, I wake up with new energy. I got a shout of new joy. I said, new joy. Say yeah. Yeah, Lord. the next verse says. I'm going to teach. I'm going to get out of your way. I'm a little behind on time, but that ain't your time. Submit. Submit. (laughs) Remain under authority. What's the next verse says? No harm. No harm. Did y'all catch that? No harm will come upon you. He will keep it from you. Oh, God help us. Jesus. I'm going to tell y'all, y'all might call it whatever you want to call it, but I'm going to tell you, you, when you're going through it, all you can see is attack. I can can tell you I'm a witness to this, that if it wasn't from God and me having a true, real, dedicated relationship, this church would have been flushed down the toilet. God let my enemies be known and seen, and one one, one of them came up to me and said, I am going to tear this church down. God says, let me show you something. Every job you get, you can't keep. Everything you touch, it won't come to nothing. Don't you mess with God's anointing. I know I'm right. I We grew when they said we should lose. We gained when they said we should have lost. That's getting, no, no, it ain't your struggle. Because the Bible says when the wicked even mock. Can I talk about my enemies? You talk about yours. 
and my foes came upon Hawkins to eat up Hawkins' flesh. They, I saw their teeth. Their breath was cutting. But I saw their teeth. They forgot to tie their shoes. And they stumbled. And fell. When folk talk about it's spooky, touch not mine anointed, it's real. Some sufferings the preacher has to go through to get you through it. There are some things I wouldn't have never known. I'm going to leave that right here had I not gone through it. So part of my anointing came from my pain. And the way you are able to relate with me is because I speak from a place you can relate with that you can't quite pinpoint. It ain't just me knowing what you're going through. It's me going through what you've gone through. And I can speak back to that and say, let me help you get out of that. If Jesus had not died, we wouldn't be able to talk about victory over death. Y'all won't lead us that ain't never been through nothing because y'all won't perfection. But Jesus said, had I never gone through betrayal and death, I couldn't tell you how to overcome it. Let me give you the second one. I'm going to get out your way. I might not even finish today. Let me go to the third one. Let me just go to the third one. Let me go to the third one. I'm done. Yeah, I'm going to go. Yeah, you get it. Okay, let me give you the, it accelerates your maturity. You got it? Good. Number three. Authority helps you grow up. Amen. I'm going to give you an example, a local example. Um, uh, Jason Tatum, who is an uh, NBA player for the Boston Celtics. People oftentimes look at him and they say, oh, he's good, he's from St. Louis. But what people don't know is that he's submitted to authority to be great. What you don't know is that every morning at 4 or 5 o'clock he was in the gym all throughout junior high school and high school every morning and then after school thousands of basketball shots multiple visits to the gym per day per week per month it, it wasn't this one day he woke up and was that gifted he put the work in when you are under a coach i'm sorry when you're under authority i'm sorry when you are under someone who's helping you go to the next level they are not trying to limit you but if you listen to their prescription they will help you be great Last one, and I'm done. Woo. Woo, woo, woo. Well, I'm skipping a lot of notes in here, but I'm going to just trust God. There one, it gives me a holistic approach to worship. Holistic means that we are comprised of more than just one thing, that we are an entity that exists with multiple parts and counterparts and connections. You are not an independent entity. You needed someone to help you get to where you've gotten. You needed someone along the way that understood your pain, understood your story, and pushed you to the level of destiny, freedom, blessedness, entrepreneurship, business, whatever you're experiencing right now, you didn't get there by yourself. So often we have, we have made singing the only expression of worship. And so we are so adamant to say we worship because we sing songs. But when you get in obedience to God, you will find that singing is just one of many expressions of worship. I believe we have been so after a sound that we've missed the Savior to the point that we sound good, but we're not under authority. So the devil is puffing us up, making us to believe that the sound will sustain us. But if the Savior ain't in it, it's nothing. It's nothing. Holistic approach to worship means God, God says it this way. Uh, God is a spirit, St. John 4 and 24, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and. So that means we just can't sing good on Sunday and then live untruthful on Monday. God wants to, God wants to grow you and wor wants you to worship in multiple capacities. Like if we just simply go to Psalms 150 for worship and we miss social justice and we miss advocating for those who cannot speak for themselves and we miss speaking truth to power and we miss those wonderful components are called loving thy neighbor. I've seen a lot of folks sing and hate folk. 
they will swear I'm in the glory of God and will come out of the glory and cuss somebody out and you're like well God must not have been that impressive it's all about lifestyle how are we exercising this worship from Monday through Saturday? And I'm not putting perfection on you, but I am putting maturity on you. So often we think we can fool God with our words because we fool people with our words. But Jesus makes it very clear. He says, these people worship me with their lips, but their hearts are in Egypt. See, we oftentimes think that lip service will get us over the hump or get us by God. And God says, I see your heart. Y'all yeah, yeah. know how stuff we say and we make promises and it takes some time for us to get to the promise that we prayed about. And we say, God, if you give this to me, you can trust me. But what God knows is that you ain't ready for it. And so it takes time because not that he don't want to give it to you, but he wants to make you trustworthy. See, God wants you to be blessed, but he wants you to be, he wants you, he wants you to give him glory for more than just a season. See, God, God is working on y'all right now, and he's trying to help you all to become sustainable representatives of God and not overnight failures. Because quickly rise, quickly fall. Anything that comes out the ground the next day, don't trust it. If you know anything about agriculture, anything that comes out the ground the next day is a weed. Kill it. Anything that happens too fast, That's it. move away from it. Yeah. Something is inauthentic about it. It's a GMO seed. Yeah, it's genetically modified. See, God wants to cultivate you. One of the powerful concepts of worship, the word worship was actually mentioned for the first time in Scripture. And there's this thing in Bible interpretation called the law of first mention. That the actual meaning of the word is actually found where it's first mentioned. So the word is mentioned when God speaks to Abraham and tells Abraham to give up your only son. He tells him, go worship me in the mountain and sacrifice your only son. Y'all like, that's morbid. God, that's nasty. Like, for real, Jesus. I can't believe you would command that of us. Truth of the matter is, he's testing him. He gets to the place of worship. Before he does that, he sees the servants to his left and right. He tells them, he says, me and the lad, me and my only son, we're going to go over there and worship in that mountain over there. He gets over there to the mountain to worship. And it is there he realizes God has provided a ram in the bush. Can I just share this with you all? Worship opens doors. Because God wants to see if you will give everything to him. See, it's more than just this idea of, God, I felt your presence. It's about if you're willing to give your all. So if we really go worship biblically, Abraham was not playing a tambourine on his way to the mountain. He was not singing the latest, greatest worship contemporary song. He was, he was carrying what mattered to him the most. Yeah. <clears throat> got to catch this. He's got what he values highly. Could you imagine each step he takes, he's thinking, <clears throat> I waited 20 years to get this and now you're telling me to every step was a step of death I waited all these years to get to this place and now you're telling me to give it up not just give it up but kill it We off the time read scriptures too fast. And he went to the mountain. No, 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 stop. When I was in Africa two years ago, because of course that's where Genesis takes place at. When you see mountains, you see them as though they're so close, but as you begin walking, they're so far away. And 
I'm talking like mountains, y'all. And you're walking towards it. And you're thinking you're closer, but the closer you get, the further away it looks. I don't believe Abraham <clears throat> just hopped, skipped, and jumped there. I, I think it was a very thoughtful journey. He's walking. His son is probably asking him questions. Dad, why is it just you and me? His dad got to say, son, just trust me. Dad, nobody else is with us. And we know he asks questions because when he gets to the place, he says, Dad, I see the fire. Yeah. I see the wood. Where's the sacrifice? You could imagine the father, Abraham, saying, Son, just be quiet. When he gets to the place of sacrifice, it's when God shows him, I always had this provision waiting on you. Now y'all got to go on the other end. There's this, there's this sacrifice, this goat, this ram. And there is this ram. Now here's God. Here's God. Y'all got to see God playing both parts. The animal has to hear the voice of God. Go down to this place. Animals are instinctive. The animal responds to the voice of God. Like the animals, the ravens responded to the voice of God. Like the donkey responded to the voice of God. This, this ram is responding to the voice of God because God is setting up both sides. All you got to do is show up to see what he's already set up. That's what worship is. I don't understand this, but I submit. I don't get this, but I submit. If you have not experienced the pain of having to go a direction you never thought, you ain't ready for worship. Real worshipers are going through stuff you never could imagine, but they're saying, yet I trust you. Yet I believe you. Yet I'm going to stay. I don't like this. I'm going to trust you when I can't trace you. Trace you. I'm going to believe you when I cannot see you. Can we stand all over the house?